Hello, welcome to another episode of Lost to Time. This is a podcast where we discuss musicians, composers, and more whose music is lost to time. These are artists from marginalized groups who deserve a listen and deserve more to be known about them. Today, you're joined by myself, Joshua Mallard, and our other host, Han Hitchin. Hello, thank you for listening today. Yes, we got a good one for everyone today. Uh, But first, let us tell you a bit about this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Contemporary Art Music Project. And we want to tell you a bit about camps, upcoming events, past events, and all the stuff that you might be interested in. So first off is this is only one of three other podcasts. You can tune into uh, Musical Headwaters, where there was recently an interview with Hilary Tan. You can also listen to Play the Ink, where there was an interview with Ayun Huang and Mari Kimura. And also there's a podcast, Earshot, with an interview with David Liptak. So lots of interviews, but these podcasts also have some interesting things that you'll definitely want to hear Earshot's all about the cutting edge of contemporary classical music. Play the Ink explores the relationship between composers and performers. And Musical Headwaters um, goes into the creative processes behind composers' compositions. And of course, you have us, who (laughs) we just told you about. All that said, podcasts aren't the only thing to know about. Camp is having a big music festival. That is Campground 22. So this is Camp's inaugural International Music Festival, and it's a whole bunch of artists from around the world, a big festival of music, and you can experience all the performances and visual arts, um, meet a lot of composers and musicians, and that is all happening in Florida. So this is from March 24th to 26th in 2022 um, in both Tampa and St. Petersburg. You can find more information on that at contemporaryartmusicproject.org under the events schedule tab. So Han, how about you tell us a little bit more about <laughs> all this stuff going on? Absolutely. Well, Josh, you actually did a great job of covering everything that's going on, but y'all need to know that this all cannot happen without y'all support. Now, we always appreciate y'all listening to our podcasts and tuning into live events as they're streamed. But Campground 22 does have a GoFundMe that is going. And if you donate, um, there's a different list of tiers that you can be a part of. And what you are doing is you're supporting Campground 22 and helping make it a reality. So if you are interested in donating and supporting Camp and Campground 22, just go on the contemporaryartmusicproject.org, scroll down, and you'll find a link to a GoFundMe page where you can donate today. Yes, and we have to say thank you to everyone who's already donated. Uh, You're truly investing in the future of art music when you donate to Camp. We're hoping to keep bringing this festival to the Tampa, St. Petersburg area and Two people who have been in that area were so glad to see, you know, some new music activity happening around there. Absolutely. All that said, we have a lot to get into today. So you've probably read the episode title, unless (laughs) you're really spoiler conscious, but this is all about Scott Joplin. And some of you who might be more informed about this might be thinking, well, Scott Joplin, uh, you know, is, is Scott Joplin lost the time? The king of ragtime, as they say. Um, but I think Scott Joplin kind of proposes the question that Han and I have been bouncing back and forth, and that's, what does it mean to be acknowledged? What does it mean to have your music revived? And what is a really honest way of doing that and observing that and you know, can we really say that someone in the position of, say, Scott Joplin or someone else we were thinking of talking about Robert Johnson, you know, godfather of blues, are these people actually, you know, established um, in the minds of people today, in the curriculums of today? All this stuff we're going to get into, but, you know, we kind of told you a little bit, Scott Joplin is the ragtime master. Yes. And he wrote, what was it, over 40 rags? Like yes, that. a lot. <laughs> yes. More than than we have for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, one of them alone sold hundreds of thousands of copies, but we're going to talk about that a bit later. Yes, this is someone who was immensely popular 
but um, also not in some ways. Kind of a perplexing scenario that we'll get into more, but those of you who tuned into our Julia Perry episode might have an inkling of how this happens. People who accomplish a lot but are not fully acknowledged after their lifetime or perhaps in the future. In the case of Scott Joplin, this is someone who is... Uh, is this the earliest composer we've, or yeah, earliest composer we've talked about? This might be, yeah. He was born in 1868, so that is quite a while ago. All right, well then, <laughs> how about you kick this off on? Yeah, so as I said, uh, Scott Joplin was born in 1868. He was born in Texas, although no one knows exactly which city he was born in. Um, and his mother was a freeborn woman from Kentucky, and his father was actually a former slave from North Carolina. And he was one of six children. So he's coming from a big family and his parents have to work and help support them. Of course, um, the father moved to, well, the fa- the entire family moved to Texarkana, Arkansas in 1888, which is a city that's right on the Texas, Arkansas border. And the father there worked as a railroad laborer and the mother was a cleaner to try and support them and their six kids. You know, because, you know, you got to support a family all the time. I just have to say, that's a funny city name. Like, they really put Texas and Arkansas almost together. Oh, yeah. No, I saw that. And I'm like, is that actually the name? So, yeah, if you're from Texarkana, Arkansas, then shout out to you. (laughs) Yeah, we don't all have interesting city names. We really don't. Um, But yeah, so in addition to working to support their kids, his parents were also musicians and actually helped provide their son with a rudimentary music education. So by age seven, he was playing piano often while his mother was cleaning or just after school. So here he was getting this music education just from his parents at first. Yes. And that's a bit of a trend we've been seeing in other um, musicians we've covered that music from a young age whether that's in families or in like rich musical environments leads to, (laughs) I guess, musicians who are really great. You Mm -hmm. know, that early stimulation of music goes a long way. And we see it with Scott Joplin. Um, So Joplin was pretty ambitious and practiced piano just after school. Um, But his early education is where things get a bit interesting. Um, It's said that most of his education in music came from Julius Weiss, um, a music professor who immigrated to Texas in 1860s. Um, and this was a Jewish pianist. Yeah, he was a Jewish pianist. Uh, and he came from Germany. And even back in the 1860s, there was a lot of anti-Semitism towards Jews in Germany. So he was often... Um, in interviews, he talked about how while he was living in Germany, he was called a Christ killer, which obviously is very anti-Semitic and problematic. Um, and he talked about having his own experience with um, ethnic and religious prejudice because of it. Well, that's a big deal because the question here is then, how do people of color in the U.S. in the 1860s get a musical education? And here Joplin is studying in the home of you know a white man and this backstory sheds some light on that like how did this happen you know wasn't everyone racist back then um well this is someone who's a bit experienced you know definitely in um prejudice and being discriminated against so maybe that led to opening the door to um scott joplin but of course this is you know a bit of speculation some people even don't agree with the idea that Julius Weiss was the exact person who taught Joplin. But there's some mix up with biography, things like that. But I think from what we can tell, this is actually a factual, like Mm -hmm. corroborated by Joplin's um, later wife. Yeah. After he died, his widow talks uh, quite a bit about how Joplin, even after he was um, facing dementia in his, his later years, he still remembered Weiss and talked about his experiences with him. Yep, they stayed connected um, from what we can read. But anyways, um, Weiss was giving lessons to Joplin for free. Um, and 
Joplin was apparently fairly talented. Um, so even though his family's financial situation was not great, um, he was still able to get this education uh, from Weiss. Mm -hmm. So it was during this time that Joplin was introduced to folk music and classical music, um, including opera, which, yes, Joplin would one day write. Um, so that's actually something we'll get into. The, that's really actually awesome. The king of ragtime has other skills. <laughs> yes. And I mean, this is something we'll talk a bit about more, but it's important to know that like Joplin is an accomplished musician, but a very accomplished composer as well. Um, and this is just like kind of one of the perplexities of like how people like Joplin are like represented, I guess, you know, um, it makes me think of like Miles Davis, like mm -hmm. Miles Davis, renowned jazz musician. But would people say great thinker? There's a interview where Miles Davis was saying he was not acknowledged as a great thinker during his time because people only cared about, uh, black musicians being jazz musicians and stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, blues ragtime all this sort of combines into like you know um these african american originated art forms um and genres and of course that leads into jazz so uh, i mean this is a tangent but you know how is joplin's music represented after his lifetime how is he credited how is he thought of is he thought of as a great composer as much as like a great ragtime composer a songwriter a musician a things popular like that. composer yeah and are we recognizing him for the ambitions that he had while he was alive because while yes he was very talented at writing ragtimes there were clearly other genres that he wanted to venture into but we'll get into that <laughs> just a little teaser there yeah yeah um so here we hit the um you know we talked about like his early education um, and after moving to Texarkana, uh, I think that's how you would say it, the 1880s is not a well-documented time of Joplin's life. Um, it's believed that he went to Sedalia, Sedalia, Missouri for a while. Um, so traveling as a musician and Eventually, he ended up working with a ragtime pioneer, another ragtime pioneer, Tom Turpin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he definitely was not like he was definitely a very active musician during this time of his life, even if it wasn't well documented. And shortly after, in 1891, he actually returned to Texarkana where he not only performed with a local minstrel company, but he also toured with his own formed vocal group, the Melody Quartet, and they were touring during the eight during 1893 and 94. And yeah, I just want to jump in there and say, yeah. like, well, we can definitely see he's touring, but like a minstrel company, you know, that's definitely something that speaks to the times, you know, that mm -hmm. black musicians had to tour with minstrel companies. Yeah. So that's just, you know, some I guess, historical context there of mm -hmm. like, oh, this is kind of an interesting footnote that might be worth looking into for those who have more time. What were minstrel companies, minstrel shows, minstrel music, all that stuff? Yeah, go for it. Um, but yeah, by 1894, he not only was he in his own quartet in the minstrel company, but he also joined a 12 member ensemble for African American musicians called the Queen City Cornet Band. And here he played on the lead cornet as well as formed a dance band with some of the other members. So if it's not clear enough, he was a very busy, prolific, active musician during this time. Yeah, cornet. I mean, people when they when they do talk about Scott Joplin are not thinking cornet player <laughs> yeah no they're like no that, that's the guy who wrote the entertainer right no he was a cornet player he wrote an opera he did a lot of stuff y'all now maybe han you can talk a bit more about this but in 1895 he traveled to texas and witnessed a staged uh collision between two locomotives well i mean okay how about you start yeah that yeah off? so for those of y'all who don't know what a locomotive is it's essentially a steam engine so imagine going to well, this is a train yeah it's a two steam trains so um, i guess this is like the the 19th century equivalent of monster truck events but even that's weird like 
Yeah, well, the I don't think, I don't know, I've never been to a monster truck event. I don't imagine they have the trucks just smashing into each other. But this is a, literally an event where they had two steam engine trains just colliding into one another. That was the event. That was the whole purpose of entertainment for everyone. And Well, they didn't have Netflix back then, you know. They, they didn't had have, to do something. They didn't have Netflix. They didn't have monster trucks. They had um, crashing steam trains. They had trains. monster locomotives. Yes, that was the, the badass form of entertainment at the time. And... As inspiration from the event, he ended up writing a piece called The Crush Collision March. And this piece, along with a few other works of his, were published in Temple, Texas that same year in 1895. That same year. So he saw it and he was like, I got to get this done. I got to get this out. Get it published. Uh, People have to know this happened. I mean, it's turning eyes, you know, (laughs) decades, centuries later, like, um, I didn't know people were doing that back then, watching trains collide. Me neither, but I mean, it's a very enlightening form of entertainment. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like now the railways are maybe like too too essential infrastructure-wise to have some of the railways used for colliding two trains. Well, now we got monster trucks and I'm trying to think of other... We have Florida drivers. So. Yeah, we have Florida drivers. So we're in Pennsylvania now. So Yeah, if you ever want something that's close to a locomotive locomotive collision, go ahead and drive on I-4 for half an hour and tune in. Let us know how you enjoyed it. Yeah, and you can write a piece about it. So monster locomotives aside, um, at some point Joplin began... Um, attending classes at George R. Smith College and was also teaching piano and composition to many younger composers who would do ragtime. So I guess maybe like passing on his ragtime skills, Um, including Arthur Marshall and Scott Hayden. Hayden. Yeah, and he ended up composing a few collaborative ragtimes with Hayden um, later on in their careers. Yep, and it's here that things sort of, um, I guess, pick up in 1898. So we've come quite some ways from, um, you know, the 1880s um, and the 1868 when Joplin was born. Um, During this time, Joplin began performing on piano at the Maple Leaf Club and the Black 400 Club. Uh, where he met a person named John Stark, who's a publisher, and would end up publishing a third of Joplin's known works. So a lot of them. Um, Go on, Han. Yeah, that was definitely a very important relationship to have there. And speaking of publishing, um, in 1899, Joplin was interested in publishing his original rags. And usually the arrangement um, between publishers and composers was that popular music would be purchased for $25 at most, so usually less than that. And naturally, Joplin was not satisfied with that arrangement, so he ended up hiring a lawyer before publishing again, and thankfully it paid off because his next publication was one of his biggest hits, The Maple Leaf Rag, which was written in honor of the Maple Leaf Club, and this ended up selling half a million records, and... For those who want to quickly do some mental math, he earned a penny for every copy that he sold. So this provided him a stable income over the, a few years. Yeah, and there's there's some like context here, I guess. Like first off, half a million to a million records sold um, is a lot. You know, like mm-hmm. there's people who don't even do that today with all the internet and Spotify and everything like that. Oh yeah. Um. But this, of course, didn't happen instantly. It's more like over the years after um, the release and his lifetime. Yeah, the but, first year was not as successful. The second year, I think, is when it started to pick up. Yeah, it was like something like a few hundred his first year, like 400 copies um, or something like that. But the key there is that this sold a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, and by 1909 is actually when it sold half a million. So that's a lot in 1909. In 10 years. Yes. And then not to mention the amount of like interest in the maple leaf rag that would come long after Joplin's death. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so despite being clearly a successful composer, I mean, his 
pieces were getting tons and tons of sales. He wanted to write for more than just ragtime and wanted to specifically write for lyrical theater. So things like opera and musical theater. So his first attempt at this was a piece called The Ragtime Dance, which was a ballet for dancers and a singer narrator. And this piece depicts an African-American ball similar to the ones that were held back at the Black 400 Club that he used to perform at. Now, that's interesting right there, because this was inspired by balls at the Black 400 Club and Maple Leaf Rag, Maple Leaf Club, you know, all these connections from his time as a musician in these areas. So it kind of reminds me of like, you know, some of the other composers we've talked about, like Undine Smith Moore, um, rich musical environment, Julia Perry, rich musical environment, um, drawing inspiration from the things around them. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's just an interesting thing. You start to see trends (laughs) as you go through these episodes and look at these different musicians and composers. Absolutely. Yeah, so his next work was actually, I think his first opera called A Guest of Honor, composed in 1903. And this is a dramatization of a meeting where Booker T. Washington was invited to dinner at the White House with the new president, Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Booker T. Washington was the new president's advisor. So these two already had a close professional relationship with one another. And this event only took place two years before the opera was completed. So this event is important because once the Southern press and politicians learned that the new president invited a black man to the White House for dinner, this caused a lot of scandal, a lot of scrutiny, a lot of condemnation to a point where the White House just did not invite any black people to the White House for nearly three decades after this. Wow. I mean... I guess this is even more telling of how significant it is that, you know, someone like Scott Joplin of his background was selling half a million copies of, of you know, his, his works at a time like this. And I think it's so interesting to see that, like, Joplin is thinking of expanding, like, King of Ragtime, but also, you know, how can we bring this to other other um, genres uh, getting into this lyrical writing Um, So this was an opera by Scott Joplin, but, um, well, first, many people don't know he has an opera, and then he has a second opera, (laughs) Tree Monitia, um, which is composed uh, in 1910 by Joplin. And I don't know, this is just a really, really cool opera, Mm -hmm. and we'll definitely talk more in detail about that during, like, you know, that portion of this, so we won't spoil it, but Mm -hmm. it's just so interesting, Um, but... You know, it was received very well during its time, but it was, of course, very hard to get an opera performed, period, and even harder for someone like Joplin to get an opera performed. It had its first full performance of the complete thing in 1972, and here we have another Pulitzer Prize winning composer Mm -hmm. in this, Um, much like uh, Undine Smith Moore won a Pulitzer Joplin would this would be quite a while after his death so he died in um, 1917 and won the Pulitzer in 1976 so the premiere or the first full performance of Tree Manisha happened in 1972 also a long time after his death so um, awarded this Pulitzer Prize you know decades after yeah but of course this is still super significant we know Pulitzer Prizes are a big deal Um, But the question remains, you know, why are Pulitzer Prize winning composers, composers who sell millions of records, um, not getting fully acknowledged after their death? Um, Though it's a bit complicated in the case of some people like, say, Scott Joplin and Robert Johnson, who seem to have a lot of credibility in certain circles and not so much in others, Mm -hmm. which we'll get into after we talk about, about the pieces. Absolutely. Yeah. And while it's definitely not to be underplayed how much their success was in ragtime and how relevant their how relevant their prolificness, is that the word? Prolificy? Yeah. I mean, they're Joplin's really prolific in ragtime. Yeah, in the case yeah. of Robert Johnson, that's blues. So. No, yeah, I didn't realize. But yeah, with um, Joplin, he was really prolific in ragtime. And that's definitely an accomplishment on its own. But he's also accomplished in 
opera. And I feel like that's something that just no one talks about. That's two operas. Yeah, I haven't heard a guest of honor, but Trima Nisha is like really a long, super significant work. Um, but again, <laughs> we don't want to spoil that. Yeah, no, we're not spoiling nothing. We're just saying, y'all, just just keep in mind, these are multi-talented individuals. Yes, we have cornet playing, piano playing, uh, teaching, composing, and, you know, Pulitzer Prize, as well as all this touring going on. A man who wears many hats and wears them very well. Yep. Yes. So moving on towards the end of Joplin's life, unfortunately, he was suffering with I believe it was syphilis and dementia. And by the end of his life, he ended up having to be housed in a psychiatric hospital, which is where he died in 1917 and ended up being buried in an unmarked grave. Now, that's interesting. Syphilis. um, And it's definitely tragic. But we've seen like back at during this time, a lot of people, you know, diagnosed with syphilis leading to their death. And it's like one of those things where like, you know, I wonder if there's more into that, like, was the cause syphilis, was there more info on it, you know? Yeah. If you look at some other famous people, they get a similar, like, syphilis diagnosis and then die, you know? Yeah, it's definitely a common thing. Um, who were you thinking specifically? Well, I don't actually know how common it is, but I'm thinking of, like, you know, the com- the controversy over, like, uh, Mozart's death, you know, like, what actually, like, what, what was he actually... Um, ill with at the time of his death there's so many different um diagnosis or diagnoses um and with joplin it's like you know we don't have a full biography or we of course don't have his medical records and stuff so i wonder like you know is there more to that maybe Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's a, a hardcore history uh question or for the joplin scholars because there are people out there studying joplin like that Oh, yes. But it's about time we get into the nitty gritty of some of Joplin's compositions. And there's many of them that are, you know, you'd say are slept on um, that we'd like to talk a bit about, uh, especially Tremonisha is one of them. But there's a few others that might interest you. And like last time, maybe uh, when we start to talk about a piece, you can go give it a listen before we spoil everything for you. But we like to tell you a bit about what we liked in the piece and what you might like and what most people might not maybe think of. Yeah. Or maybe you want to know everything first and then going in to listen to the piece, being informed with everything that we tell you. Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's like it's music. It's not like a movie, but like, you know, what if (laughs) someone spoiled, um, I don't know, Firebird for you, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you seen the the video where the lady in the audience like screams oh yeah that was great <laughs> you know us on spoiled things for that lady we wouldn't have we wouldn't that. have that video where we all laugh at her or with her we're oh you're laughing her. at her no we're <laughs> laughing with her she probably looks wow. at the video and laughs too i i would but anyways let's talk a bit about joplin's music um so that you can you know check this out for yourself and then we'll circle back into where's joplin's legacy today where it should be, is it at the right place, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. All that said, Han, how about you start us off with the first piece by Joplin? Yeah, so the first piece we're going to talk about today is one of his popular ragtime pieces, the Maple Leaf Rag. And this is the one we talked about earlier that um, he ended up selling half a million copies of after the first decade of its publication, which is a really big deal at the time. And he got a penny for every copy that it sold. So that's a really um, small but still se- steady source of income for him. Well, someone run the calculation on that. Then. Yeah, someone <laughs> did the math. I'm not good at math. Sorry. But yeah, um, it's not all at once, but... Um... You know, (laughs) we talk about sheet music sales now, not making money, but... Oh, yeah. It was still Imagine you sell half a million copies of it. Oh, yeah. I'd like to sell half a million copies of one of my pieces. That'd be great. Um, But, yeah, so this piece, he was published at 1899, so right before the turn of the century. And at the time it was published, it was considered a really difficult piece in terms of performability, um, especially compared to a lot of other ragtime pieces that were out But over time, uh, Maple Leaf Rag actually became a model 
for future ragtime composers and ragtime pieces. So a lot of them would look at Maple Leaf Rag to kind of create a form and an idea for their own pieces. And this kind of helps standardize the performance practice of rag. Now, in terms of a little bit of background for this piece, the Maple Leaf Rag, as implied, is um, in honor of the Maple Leaf Club back in Missouri, that, where Joplin would spend a lot of his time, as well as the the um, 400 Black Club, or the Black 400 Club, my bad. Yes. And what's really important about what Han's saying is this piece was groundbreaking. It really changed how people viewed the piano and piano writing. Um, all this really syncopated stuff that you hear in the piece is like not super common at all at the time, especially in like the vocabulary, the harmonic vocabulary that is um, taking place in the piece. Um, what's also cool is like the little bit of it history, like selling 500 million copies. Um, we're talking about like this whole Tin Pan Alley stuff too. Like, between 1900 and 1910, there's this sheet music of rags being, um, I guess, like sold. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just a really big deal that people are getting their hands on this um, Joplin music. And it's it's not easy compared to a lot of the other stuff that's being passed around in Tin Pan Alley. So that's just actually really cool. Um, and it's this little pocket of history that comes before, um, you know, jazz that would uh, flood through Tin Pan Alley in the 20s. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's kind of this whole, um, well, I said like it's a pocket of history. And it's it's like when you look at how sheet music functions and how popular music was handled in that time, it's actually like, ties into Scott Joplin because Joplin is composing popular music. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole nother thing that um, Maple Leaf Rag is very successful as a piece of popular music and as a, you know, artistic high art. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call it. Yeah. Composition. Um, there's this duality to it. Uh, so I think that's what's really cool. And I think you're going to really enjoy this piece. It's basically like a classic. And it's one of those pieces that you have to hear. Um, now, the piece itself wasn't super acknowledged prior to Joplin's death. Like, there's a whole 1970s revival of Joplin's music that's a really big deal. Um, and that's just like a trend you see with composers that are, you know, in, in marginalized groups, it's like right after they die, do their works continue to live on? Um, or is there a revival effort nearly half a century later? Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually what happened in the seventies. There's a big revival of Joplin's music. Um, even though I, it was, it was popular prior to his death. Mm -hmm. It's kind of weird, like an ebb and flow in the popularity yeah. of the work. There's also something really cool about this. Um, there are piano roll recordings. Like Joplin went into the studio and recorded um, these piano rolls that were like punched, um, I guess, kind of like a player piano card where it's punched in mm -hmm. and so these were recorded by Joplin now there's debates over how authentic they are because they were edited and at the time that Joplin recorded he was concerned about the longevity of his music during um, his loss of motor skills so this was towards the end of his life where he said I want to you know solidify this music mm -hmm. and get it recorded in some way and that's what happened but then, you know, the controversy is that, well, he didn't play it super well because of his deteriorating health. So it was heavily edited by the um, studio personnel there. And then it's like, OK, um, but if you're on YouTube, you might see like different recordings played by Scott Joplin. And it's these that we're referring to the piano roll, pianola roll recordings that Joplin played in, which is actually super cool. It's basically like these can be recreated through MIDI now. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really good that technology's given us the opportunity to 
take these recordings that are really old and just kind of create newer, better quality ones. That's true. And I guess it raises questions as well. This is more of like a musicianship thing, but how would the composers of these works play their own pieces and how are they played today? You know, varying styles, especially with something like jazz, blues, ragtime, um, or you hear about it with like romantic composers like Chopin. How would Chopin play his own piece? Mm -hmm. And then um, how would students of Chopin play the piece compared to, you know, professionals in the future and at the time? Um, in this case, Joplin had like his own, I guess, like directives. Like he'd say, don't play a ragtime super fast. You know, yeah. they're not meant to be played um, really fast. But then apparently in the piano roll recordings, he would play them fast. So, <laughs> I mean, I i don't know <laughs> what's the most authentic, but he wants I think, his, he wants know. his students to be better than him. Well, I just think that's a little cool anecdote that it's something we can at least see documented about, you know, him going into the studio, having a view on how these should be played and all that. Mm -hmm. And this also being sheet music that ended up in people's hands. Yes. Anyways, if you're going to listen to Joplin, you have to hear Maple Leaf Rag and you have to hear The Entertainer, which you might be like, oh, wait, I know these pieces. I recognize them. They're that popular. They've been in <laughs> so many shows and I mm -hmm. guess like pop culture that you've, you've definitely heard it. You just might not know it's Scott Joplin. Yeah, a lot of people don't know the composer. And if they do know the composer, even the name, um, Scott Joplin, a lot of them don't know much about the composer. I mean, most people don't know that he wrote an op opera. Many people don't know Two. that he's black. Yeah. I mean, people don't know a lot about him. Yes, that's very true. Um, but thankfully, there is there a 70s revival. And, you know, it's kind of hard to tell how well that all went coming back over, you know, 40 years later. But Let's get into the other pieces <laughs> before we dive into that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the next one we could talk about is Trimonitia. Yes. Trimonitia, yeah. The big opera. Yes, this is actually a really, <laughs> it's it's a big opera. I mean, it's a, a large form, large scale work. And it took so long for this piece to get a full, complete performance. It wasn't until... It was 1972, yeah. long after Joplin's death, and then, bam, gets a Pulitzer Prize. Oh, yeah. So long after his death, unfortunately. Well-deserved. Mm -hmm. uh, this piece is really awesome, um, and it's actually one that is basically slept on in the context of Joplin. Most people haven't heard this, and it doesn't have... Um, you know, uh, a huge amount of uh, recordings compared to other operas at the time. And I think that's a shame because this is a composer who was selling millions of copies of music, very influential, groundbreaking, makes an opera, and, you know, it's not performed till decades after his death. Yeah, it's really a shame. That being said, um, let's talk a bit about it and... You can check it out <laughs> either before or after we talk about it. Mm -hmm. But don't worry, we're not going to spoil too much. We just want to talk about the overarching theme and just let you know a little bit about what it's about so we can um, tell you, you know, how cool the music is. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is like a, I, I wouldn't, it's not described as a cautionary tale or like a moral tale, but there's a definite theme to the opera that is about um, you know, education being a big deal, being uh, vital and freeing you from ignorance in a way. Um, and this is because Tremanisha um, is all about uh, this woman, Tremanisha, trying to free her community um, of ignorance. Um, basically, the community is very superstitious and um, kind of under the thumb of these conjurers who uh, prey on the ignorance and fear of the villagers to, um, you know, make money and earn their living. Trimanish is stirring the pot, you know. Trimanish is trying to stop this influence and educate her community and free them of this uh, superstition, this ignorance. And then the conjurers are not happy, as you can imagine, and they kidnap Trimanisha. Um, 
And, you know, long story short, Trimanisha is rescued and ends up freeing the villagers of this influence. Um, now, I hope that didn't spoil too much. There's more intricacies to the story. And, of course, there's, you know, characters and stuff. But um, I thought we'd just tell you a little bit about that. Um, and some people refer to this as, like, the ragtime opera. There are moments of ragtime in the opera. Um, mm-hmm. But there's also a lot of, like, you know, I guess you would call it lyrical operatic, you know, what you would expect in an opera. Yeah, definitely. Um, And another important thing to note is that the libretto was written by Joplin himself. So so it is. He did (laughs) the opera music, the score, and the libretto. Yeah, so this is a lot of work on his part. And it is considered to be a direct um, reflection of his beliefs on education for the Black community. Yeah, and um, what's also important to know is not only is it incorporating ragtime, it's incorporating like folk music elements. So, I mean, you could say ragtime is comes out of folk music, mm-hmm. but this is just like a big deal. Like this is an opera from a person of color in the early 1900s that's incorporating ragtime, incorporating folk music elements. And the story itself is really kind of steeped in some things that, Joplin cares about, you know, um, not just in the setting, but the themes and all that. Yeah. So I think this is one that's definitely you should listen to. <laughs> it's yes. not one that many people give credit where it's due. Yes, there is a full production line for listening. And there's also a score video, I believe. Yeah. So there's an amazing score video. There's also... um it's on IMSLP. You can like really access the um, the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of like elaborate on that, though, it's um, the production video by the Houston Grand Opera. Um, so you can see the video, the staging, and you can also follow along a full score video of the opera, which is really cool. It's like the reduced score um, piano and voice yeah. So definitely check that out if you're, you know, into the composition at all. It's just, I, I think it's amazing that, you know, a piece that didn't get performed until 1972, long after its creation is available, you know, like that. Yes. But that means we should hopefully see more performances of it. The Houston Grand Opera one is fairly recent, so it's really awesome to see that, you know, this is a new production Yeah. Speaking of new performances, this piece, unfortunately, didn't have a fully uh, full production premiere until 1972, I believe it was. Yeah, at the Atlanta World premiere. Yeah. And keep in mind that Joplin died in 1917. So it took almost another lifetime of his before this piece ended up getting its premiere. But that doesn't mean it didn't have any attempts at a performance while he was alive. There were a few um, in 1911, he did get a informal run through of the piece, but there was no full orchestra or scenery. I believe it was just maybe a few voices and piano. Um, and then there was a staging in 1913 that was produced. However, it was only of the final uh, movement or the final scene. And then there was one orchestral performance in 1915, but it was of the ballet from the second act called Frolic of the Bears. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's all of that piece that was performed during his lifetime. Yeah. And actually looking at this a bit closer. So we have the world premiere. That was 1972. And that was the um, Atlanta Symphony. Um, The Houston Grand Opera one is actually um, a like video production for PBS. Um, like, (laughs) you know, not PBS kids, but PBS, the public broadcasting service. Yes. Yes. Um, and also it looks like, uh, the university of Illinois at Mm -hmm. (laughs) Urbana-Champaign, I've been there, um, did a production of it in 1991. So that's actually really cool. Um, there's the opera theater of St. Louis in 2000 and this there's actually like variations in the dialect of like 
the speaking, I think. Oh. So you'll notice that if you hear um, recordings of like the text, it's in English, Mm -hmm. but there's dialect to it. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yep. And it seems like there's um, the latest stage production is like 2003, at least in the US. And then um, I think there's another version in 2015 um, by, I can't pronounce this, but it's um, a, a theater in Dresden. Um, so if you want to dig around, there's actually some productions of this available, um, though it'd be nice to see some more U.S. premieres recently. The Stutch Gauspiel, I think that's how it is pronounced. Yep. Um, so there's some CDs out there, like the Paragon Ragtime Orchestra. And then, of course, you can see the um, the Houston um, Grand Opera online on YouTube mm-hmm. and the score video. So. I was actually super surprised that like I hadn't heard of this. Um, I I was clued into uh, to it like a year ago, and um, I'm glad to see the videos on YouTube. Some of them are actually recently uploaded. So a year ago, mm-hmm. when I was looking, they weren't there. Like not all of them, but now there's some videos that are super, you know, <laughs> accessible. Yeah, it's really good to have accessibility to these pieces. Um, you know, even if it's long after the people who wrote them are dead, I think it's really important to have them documented so that we can not only go listen to them, but be able to talk about them like this. Yeah. And this is just one you have to listen to. There's so much variety in the um, in the music. I think it's definitely if you like opera or if you like ragtime, even if you like not, <laughs> if you if like you don't nothing, like, yeah, <laughs> you should listen to this one. Um, it's got like so much cool stuff in there, um, and I think it's something that should you know pop up more when people talk about operas or consider staging or you know doing a production of an opera. Oh yeah, and it's not his only opera. Um, so we're we're not going to talk about the other one, but that is the one you should also check out. Guests of Honor. Yep, that one's good. And actually, that is the second opera or the second staged work by um, Joplin. The first one is the Ragtime Dance. Yes, but that the Ragtime Dance is not an opera. I believe it's a ballet. Yeah, I haven't been able to hear that one. So if anyone out there knows a the link, send it our way. Yeah, or just go find one and party hard to it. Yep, do some of that. <laughs> So we've talked quite a bit. <laughs> We're running out of time. So we want to tell you about Joplin's legacy, you know, where his music is at today. Um, I think you can't ignore, you know, the the weird drop in his work after his death. Um, there is the revival in the 70s, which I think was really good. Um, but my main thing with Joplin that's more perplexing is that Despite being, you know, a well-known composer and a, a immensely, you know, innovative musician and composer, uh, you don't see Joplin discussed in the same circles as other 20th century composers that mm-hmm. are big names. You know, like you don't see John Cage discussed next to Joplin, especially in the context of American music. Oh, yeah. So this is a, another big deal. Um, if you think about other American composers, you know, Julia Perry, Undine Smith Moore, other composers who are Pulitzer Prize winning and stuff were active in the 20th century and are not discussed in the same sort of conversations as other big American 20th century names. Generally, these are white composers who were composing, you know, like concert repertoire music. Um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, they were composing classical music and not popular music. Yeah. But of course, Joplin was composing both popular music and music for the concert halls. And in fact, um, Tree Manisha is meant to be a mix of like a serious opera and something that brings those popular elements from ragtime into the opera setting. So it's an innovative opera, actually, and it should be discussed 
in that sort of way. Oh, yeah, especially for its time. I mean, that's there's a lot of different like productions. Like if you look at a lot of stuff on Broadway, that has a lot of pop influence to it. But this is something that's happening in the 1910s, people. Like this is really, really sick. Yeah, and the question raised there is like, What does it mean to be acknowledged and what does it mean to be lost to time? Because this is a trend we see of composers um, getting their works revived and then they get that little spark for a while and then it kind of fizzles out or that after their deaths, their works kind of like fade away. Robert Johnson has almost like a a, a similar story to Joplin where amazing blues musician, super influential um, amazing guitarist who isn't acknowledged as much during their lifetime until, you know, they start getting a lot of awards well long after their death. Yeah. What we don't see as much is these influential groundbreaking musicians put alongside names like, you know, the Beethovens and the Mozarts, you know, this is, I, I think it's a development in opera to have ragtime and opera like this. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just not, many operas that do that. I can't think of any of This is the only one I can think yeah. of. So you'd think it'd be discussed in like a historical context and that um, pieces like Maple Leaf Rag would get at least a footnote in 20th century history curriculums. And of course, we're talking from the perspective of, of people who are students who are involved in academia and stuff. But it also is worth noting that despite the popularity of things like the entertainer and maple leaf rag a lot of um it's kind of weird it's like very popular very well known but it's not joplin who's well known it's the music because it's been kind of co-opted by a lot of people who have recorded it or it's been included in a lot of like you know popular media things like that it's not actually that joplin himself is getting that sort of acknowledgement and his other works are getting you know the um the same benefit as those two pieces. Mm -hmm. So just someone who makes you question, like what does it mean to be acknowledged and what does it mean to be lost to time? Um, That's just, you know, food for thought. And it's definitely something that influences, you know, who we talk about. Oh, definitely. But anyways, it'd be nice to see, you know, more performances of this. Um, There's definitely people today who are interested in ragtime. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of young composers even that I see who are writing pieces in the style of ragtime. I mean, I can think of at least one who... Well, I think everyone tries to write a rag, you know, when yeah. they're starting out. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's something that a lot of people have fun composing. And yeah, I mean, Joplin is a huge name and a huge influence in ragtime, but we can't ignore his accomplishments in, you know, his other works. Yes. And that's the thing. Like, We call him the king of ragtime, but he's a great thinker in many ways. Like this is a composition breakthrough, something that is, um, you know, 20th century Schoenberg made the 12 tone system. um, And in the 20th century, ragtime came Mm -hmm. up, you know, jazz came up, things like that. So it's kind of there's this, you know, barrier between the um, genres of music and contributions that, you know, came from um, African-Americans in the U.S. and African-influenced styles of music, it's not considered in the same light as, you know, contributions from, you know, people of the Austrian-German tradition of, like, Mahler, Schoenberg, all the way back to, you know, Beethoven, Bach, stuff like that. Yeah. That all being said, um, that's kind of, like, the key takeaway here. They're just not being included in the same sort of discussions. There's plenty of scholars out there who do study ragtime, who do study Joplin, who are, you know, interested in this stuff, but they're it's in a separate light from other music history. Yes. Despite a literal opera being <laughs> written by Joplin. Yeah, there's a there's a whole opera sitting right there waiting for <laughs> I mean listens. Yeah, I mean not just one stage work, three of them. Oh yeah. So all that said, definitely give give Joplin a listen. Um, definitely stuff you're going to enjoy, and you're definitely going to recognize it if you um, if you haven't actually consciously heard of Joplin. You've probably heard his music. Yeah, kind of similar to 
I hate this phrase, but similar to like a one hit wonder sort of situation where you know the song, but you might not know the artist by name, or if you do know them by name, you may not know their other stuff or what they're about. That's true. Just by virtue of Joplin's um, background, the world has made him a one hit wonder in a sense. Um, Though, you know, selling millions of copies is really a great accomplishment on that one that one thing but it's yeah. important that you know the bulk of his other output is presented because i mean this is a pulitzer pulitzer prize winning composer was selling millions of copies how do we not hear about him in the context of music history discussion absolutely yeah his music is really outstanding both his ragtimes his operas and i'm sure as a performer um if you find recordings out there of him performing i'm sure they're awesome too yeah, I mean, that's another thing, like performing rag music, like ragtime music on piano. I wonder if that's like something classical pianists are, you know, prepared to do, or is it like jazz pianists? It's, it's got to be its own performance practice. I imagine so, yes. All that said, we hope you enjoyed this. Um, you know, feel free to, if you're hearing this on YouTube, leave comments on people that we should take a look at and cover in these episodes. Um, this is the first musician, uh, musician, composer, someone who's, I guess, more known as a musician that we've covered. Um, and we're looking to, you know, keep expanding the net and include people who come from other, you know, backgrounds, performance practices, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we're certainly not going to know every single composer who would be a wonderful top talking point episode. We're well, if, an episode if they're on- lost to time, then yeah, there's people we definitely don't even know. Exactly, Josh. You said you said the words I wanted to in fewer words. Thank you. <laughs> Roll credits. <laughs> yes. But yes, please, any recommendations. If you want to hear us listen to or talk about a composer that you think would be great for the show, please leave a comment, a recommendation. We would absolutely love to check their music out and maybe do an episode. Yep. And just a quick review. Listen to the Maple Leaf Rag, the Entertainer, listen to Tree Manisha, um, and also just whatever else you can find, like Guests of Honor. Oh, yeah. I couldn't find any recordings of Guests of Honor, but I could find a lot of reading about it, which was still quite interesting. Yeah, some of the stuff is on CDs, some of the stuff is on YouTube, and some is on um, either only one of those or none of those. Um, so mm-hmm. definitely check it out and dig up what you can find. Um, a lot of people like to also put performances of the ragtime pieces on YouTube. Yeah. All that said, let's close this out. Um, once again, Campground 22, uh, March 24th to 26th in the St. Pete and Tampa area. That's in Florida. Um, definitely, you know, Keep your eye out for that and attend if you can. Yeah, if you're sick of the snow, because I've been told that the snow is really old by then, then Florida will be a wonderful change of pace for you. Trust me. Yeah, if you're in a a cold area, I guess it's a vacation, basically. Yes. That being said, um, there's also other podcasts to check out. Definitely go take a listen to those. Um, And we would like to remind you, uh, you can donate to camp and make sure that uh, things like this podcast and the festival keep happening. Yeah. This is uh, definitely means a lot to us, anyone who has already donated. Um, and Thank we hope- you for donating. <laughs> yes, thank you. And we hope you consider donating as well, keeping this going. Or at the very least, when Campground comes around, you know, tune in, share videos, and just get excited. Yes, any support is support. Yes. And thank you to everyone tuning in. Um Yeah, go ahead and comment anyone else you think we should check out and go and listen to the other podcasts and tell them we sent you. Yes, leave a like, leave a favorite, not just on ours, but on theirs too. (laughs) Well, you're joined by myself, Joshua Mallard, and... And co-host, Han Hitchin. Yep, and this is us signing off. We hope to see you next time.